I'm someone who's always had a hard time picking favorites. There's nothing that terrifies me more than when someone asks me, what's your favorite X? That's why I'm gonna need you to believe me when I can easily say that Nier Automata is my favorite video game. Let's face it, fellas, no one expected the original Nier to get a sequel when it came out over a decade ago. Automata brilliantly followed up the Nier story more directly than you ever believed it could, while achieving both niche and mainstream appeal. No one expected it to be the brainchild of Yoko Taro and one of the best character action game developers in the industry, Platinum Games. Which is why, four years later, no one expected the next game in the Nier series to be a smartphone exclusive with gacha mechanics. Just... why? I'll get into this later on, but a quick disclaimer. I have no love and little experience for gacha games, so this is more a perspective from someone who's playing this solely for the experience as a Nier game. The question at hand, and the one I'm gonna try and answer today is, is there gold in them there hills? You know why you play Nier games. So, is there a story in here that's worth experiencing, or is it just gonna be a nightmare of endless gacha rolls and microtransactions? Nier Reincarnation is the third game in the Nier series, and unlike the other two, it's a smartphone exclusive, currently Japan exclusive RPG with gacha elements. I can't really think of a description that gets more cursed than that, so believe me when I say I can understand most people's apprehension to this kind of thing, because I share the feeling. While most other game series like Final Fantasy, etc. have made this pact with the Crimson Ballet from Berserk, the games have usually been clearly denoted as spin-offs with little to no story. But Ol' Yoko T seems to have decided to one-up that train of thought. Not only is Nier Reincarnation the official third game in the Nier series, it takes place in the same universe and is a sequel to Automata, in the same way Automata was a sequel to the original Nier. Nier series producer Yosuke Saito said they aim to create a game that not only appeals to fans of smartphone games, but also the fans of the Yoko Taro cinematic universe. And as the story unfolds, its ties to the rest of the series will become more apparent. Bold words, and definitely ones that have convinced me to at least give Reincarnation a chance, but overall, I wasn't having my daily sweat and excitement prior to release like I was before Automata came out. So, okay, 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 what's the setting of this thing anyways? Near Reincarnation takes place in a world that's dominated by endless towering structures known as cages. You play as the white girl. Look, yes, I, I know how that sounds, but that, that that's her name. A girl who's implied to have lost many things. Her voice, her memories, and why she's woken up in this world of cages. That's a bit of a situation. She wanders around lost and alone for a bit until she has a meeting with this ghost-like character named Mama. And let me tell you, that name ain't just for show. Mama's got big RR energy. She speaks to our protagonist like a mother guiding her child, and overall acts as a reassuring guide through the towers. Oh, oh jeez, oh man, oh, oh, mama, put those away, those are, those are, those are legitimately unsettling. She sometimes even addresses the player directly as well, like, look at this one loading screen tip where she reminds you to always wash your hands and gargle after you get back home. Mama is, uh, is that because of the 2020 thing? Despite being your guide, Mama doesn't seem to be much more knowledgeable about the towers than you are, unless she's holding back. There's an early scene where a giant creature can be seen flying just outside the cage window, and Mama's just as confused as you. The game is split up into two sections, with the first being exploring the cages. There isn't much to interact with here, just a few puzzles scattered around here and there, and some hidden crows that you can tap to get some collectibles and items. Mostly though, it's just walking around. I guess you could call this another strand type game. As for the second section, to get back what was lost, our protagonist has to find these mysterious statues known as black scarecrows that are laid out throughout the cages. Accessing these scarecrows drops you into a chapter of a short story. Think kinda like A Thousand Years of Dreams from Lost Odyssey. The game switches to a 2D plane, and you control the various characters of that particular chapter. The events of the stories have been corrupted by dark crow monsters that- wait a second. Cage? Scarecrow? Birds? Oh, I get it. So to purify these scarecrows, you have to defeat the creatures that are warping the events of the story. In case you were wondering, by the way, this is how the game reconciles the fact your party probably consists of a mishmash of crossover characters like 2B, etc. You play as the girl in white, who goes into the stories, and your custom party fights the monsters warping the story, so the characters in the story can play out the events as intended. You and the monsters exist in a separate reality from the actual events taking place. Do you get what I mean? Now, you gotta defeat these monsters in battle, and this is where the gameplay comes in. So far, to me, the gameplay seems pretty simple. An ATB-like gauge will fill up and your party members will attack automatically. Aside from those, each character has two skills that'll fill up as time passes, and these are activated by the player manually, and they deal out some big damage. The name of the game seems to be chaining these skills into a combo, as they deal bonus damage based on how many hits you can pull off in a row. Each character also has a big limit break style skill that fills up as they deal and take damage. This functions pretty similarly to the other skills, but it's obviously stronger. 
Enemies also have weaknesses and resistances to certain elements, so deciding what you bring into battle with you plays an important role as well. I'm not gonna lie to you, so far it all seems pretty simple. The only real interaction you seem to have is choosing when to activate your skills and choosing which enemy to attack. You can walk around the battlefield with your middle character, but enemy attacks can't be dodged this way, and your character will automatically attack when their cage fills up anyways, so I don't really think there's any point to it. Anyways, once you clear the battle, the Scarecrow's purified and you obtain a piece of a weapon story. Once you've collected all the pieces, a staircase appears and you move on to the next cage. Smartphone games usually have a quick pick up and play loop, and this seems to be the one the game is going for. A weapon story usually takes around 5 to 15 minutes, so you can easily pick it up on the train, slam out a story or two, and then shove it back in your pocket afterwards. Now look, I prefer games that embrace longer play sessions like Nier and Automata, but I can at least appreciate the gameplay loop for Reincarnation was easy to understand right out the gate. As for the visual style, like I said, I don't play many phone games myself, but I was pretty surprised at how good the environments looked. If you had told me this was a Vita game, I would have believed you. The cage sections of the game take place in a 3D environment. You're mostly taking a look at various backdrops and skyboxes as you traverse. It's got pretty good environmental direction, and at least looks good enough to chug the frame rate during full-size battles. Inside the Scarecrows, the game takes a 2D side-scrolling approach, and again, the visual style is pretty impressive. Lots of contrasting bold darks and lights really lend for a unique visual design that doesn't only stand out as wholly unique from the 3D sections, but it looks damn good doing it. Unfortunately, we're probably going to be watching the footage on a screen 10 times the size of my phone, so it's going to look a bit blown up, but it does look a lot less jagged on the tiny screen. I'm also happy to say the soundtrack is great as well. I mean, it's got the same composer as Nier and Automata, Keiichi Okabe, so they didn't pull any punches when it came to sound production in this game. You're probably listening to it in the background of this video, but you've got the same kind of hard-hitting environmental and battle themes, as well as the vocal tracks and themes you'd find in any other Nier game. So, at the very least, even if you have no interest in this game, there's a new Fire soundtrack for you to give a listen to in the background while grinding out the Fall Guys Season Pass or something. So that's great. Stellar. So far the game has had a few positive points going in its favor. But I think we're forgetting something. I've got some good news and some bad news for you to hear. Which one do you want first? Alright, let's bite this bullet and tackle the bad news. You thought you could escape. No one can escape. This is a cursed roller coaster with no end in sight, a six letter word that strikes fear into the hearts of men and women across the globe. I'm talking about Gotcha, a made up slot machine where the prizes aren't real and the money is. You could write a novel the size of War and Peace about Gotchas. Some people like them, most people dislike them, but I mean, I don't think any game has benefited from the addition of a Gotcha slot. However, I'm also a realistic man. I know this game is free, and free games need a way to recoup costs. As someone with minimal experience in the world of rolls and pulls, what I want to know is, can you still have a worthwhile experience with this game, despite the gotcha elements? Well, first, let's take a look at simple economics. Gems are the currency you use to roll the wacky woohoo treasure slot, and this is my total after finishing the tutorial, about 18,000. Now, obviously, there are currently new release campaigns and new player campaigns that gave me a slight edge. The slot machine costs 3,000 gems for 10 rolls, and you're guaranteed a rare item if you do 10 at a time. Well, okay, that means I got about 50 rolls right out the gate. It seems like you can earn gems through challenges, so you've got a drip feed after your initial stockpile runs dry. The current premium gacha theme is a Nier Automata collab, and I mean, it's if I'm not going to spend my gems on that, right? So let's take a roll and see what we get. <laughs> Okay, 10 weapons, and I don't have enough context with the game to know if they're good or not, but I got more chances. Personally, I've never spent real money to roll a gacha, and I'm not gonna start now. But let's go take a look at the real world prices of these things. Okay, open up the shop, premium store. Seems you can buy gems in a couple different increments, but wait a sec, that seems a bit expensive? Am I reading this right? 120 gems for 120 yen? I have like 100 times that. No way, let me double check the information screen. No, I'm, I'm reading this right. One gem has a value of 1 yen. If a 10 roll set is 3,000 gems, that means 10 rolls has a value of 3,000 yen. That's 28 American dollars. That's 20 pounds sterling. That's 35.79 Canadian. That's 36 Australian didgeri dollars. That's insane. Imagine if you'd spent that real world money on rolls and gotten 10 weapons like I did. You can buy a two year old game for that price. I mean, looking at the statistics, you only have a 0.5% chance to roll 2B, 9S, or A2. That's a 1 in 200 chance. 
I don't have enough experience in this genre to tell you if that's fair or not. I'm just telling you my gut reaction. Call me a boomer, but I just don't get gotchas, man. I can't picture myself putting that kind of money into the game. Don't get me wrong, I'm absolutely all for financially supporting a game you enjoy, and I probably will kick in some money at some point, but to me, this ain't it, chief. Then I got 2B and 9S in the same role. And grabbed A2 a few rolls after. They do be looking pretty slick in their new outfits, though, not gonna lie. I don't know if I just pulled off the equivalent to winning the gacha lottery or what. I haven't played enough for the well to dry up and to have to desperately scrounge around for gems to roll like some Smeagol-like creature that exists solely within the four walls of a pachinko parlor, and I don't know if that point will come, but I'll have to keep an eye out as I play. There's also a cheeky stamina bar up in the top corner, another one of my least favorite mobile game mechanics, but it hasn't hindered me yet. You bet yourselves I'm keeping an eye on that too, though. Now, with all that out of the way, let me segue into the good news. The good news comes with the asterisk that I might be totally wrong as I get deeper and deeper into the game, but I'm currently pretty confident. The question on my mind, and I'm sure is on everyone else's, is can this game be enjoyed traditionally, as in going through the story mode without being absolutely destroyed by mandatory gacha? Right now, I'm pretty confident that it can be. The gacha seems to just be for characters and weapons. Made in side quest content, as well as the Nier Automata collab quest, isn't locked behind the gacha. It's all done through playing the game like you normally would. It makes sense to me that the 4 star characters like 2B and 9S are stronger than the one the game gives you as you play, but you level up all characters as you use them, so the question is, is that strength gap so significant? Well, I don't know. I can definitely tell my 4 star characters are stronger, but I don't think the game would be an unbeatable grind filled slog without them. I ran into a difficulty spike around the third chapter, but I solved the problem by feeding 9S some magic candy. Yeah, he likes it, trust me. There may come a day where the need for power-up items far outpaces my ability to gain them, but I'm keeping a cautiously optimistic eye out. There seems to be multiple difficulty options for when you replay missions, hard and very hard. I'd be totally cool if the normal difficulty option could be relatively easily cleared without the need to go crazy on Gacha. As for how this game relates to Nier Automata, aside from the collab quest, which is, I mean, obviously related, like I said before, the game's ties will be revealed as time goes on, but right now I'm pretty excited to find out. It all depends how much content is in the initial package, and what their pipeline is for additional content in the future. Right now, I'm picking up these data items from defeated enemies, which could have some relation. Of course, the game has its own story outside of Nier Automata, and I think that merits a discussion on its own. As of recording this voice line, I've put about 10 or so hours into the game, so while I don't have the full picture, I have been genuinely engaged with the content presented to me so far. To give you an idea, I'll walk you through the prologue, which introduces the first three characters, so while the next bit might be minor spoilers, it's only for the first hour or so of the game. We enter the Black Scarecrow and are introduced to our first two characters, Leon, a boy with a staff, and Dimis, a mysterious man wrapped in bandages. As they arrive in a town, they're ambushed by a group of bounty hunters. The leader asks Leon if he's a prince, before drawing a gun on them. A battle ensues and they defeat the bounty hunters, but now we're left with many questions. Why are they being hunted? What kind of a prince is Leon? Put these questions aside for the moment, because in Chapter 2, we play as a woman with a prosthetic arm and leg named Friend Lees, who looks a little like A2. She's gathering information for some people she's hunting for in a pub, but she doesn't manage to get anything concrete. You can kind of put two and two together here and figure the ones she's looking for are our two protagonists from the first chapter. Cut to Chapter 3, where Dimis is outside an abandoned church gathering food. As he returns to Leon, we can see that he's fallen gravely ill, putting an end to their journey. Chapter 4 opens again with Friend Lees, who seems to have finally found who she was looking for. Unlike the bounty hunters from earlier, she isn't motivated by financial reward, but instead focused on a single-minded goal, revenge. She confronts Dimis outside the church and defeats him in battle. It turns out, Leon succumbed to his illness long ago, and Dimis, being a mechanical soldier, carried out his will to protect him long after he was gone. Digging a grave, the woman buries Dimis and continues on. This leaves us with many questions. Why does Friend Lees have such a lust for revenge? What brought all of our characters here? What happens next? Each story after this focuses on the individual characters' journeys, who they are, and how they ended up the way they did. I know me explaining it at lightning speeds doesn't really paint a very good picture, but if I went into detail, we'd be here all day. I like where it's going, and the more I play and learn more about the plot, the more invested I am in the world and its characters. As far as the story's concerned, I'm at least pretty confident in saying there's quality here, but who knows, I mean, it could all go out the window. So, those were my first impressions in Nier Reincarnation. That dragged on a bit longer than I expected them to, but I figured it's best to be thorough. I wanted to make this video because I know most people don't have access to the game yet, and it being what it is, I'm sure a lot of people were wondering if it's even worth paying attention to when it finally does come over in English. While everything I say comes with an asterisk that reads, so far, 
I'm at least pleasantly surprised with the direction this game is going. I didn't really expect much, and at the very least, I have a potentially good Yokotaro plot to look forward to completing. It's got some stuff I don't like, but as long as that stays in the corner and doesn't destroy the rest of it, I can overlook a bit. By the way, even in these early stages, I can tell the game is full of Yokotaroisms. Like, if you tap Mama 100 times, you unlock a bonus mission. No, seriously, 100 times. Also, I mean, it wouldn't be near without a shmup minigame, right? I'd like to keep talking about this game in the future, but for now, well, till next time.